So I'll be, I'll be talking about some work I'm doing with collaborators as part of my dissertation in Rob Brumfield's lab at Louisiana State University. So let's start with an observation. Uh, species vary widely in the level of intraspecific divergence or divergence among populations. For example, the uh, thought-winged ant wren looks pretty dramatically different from place to place across its distribution in the Amazon basin and also has a, a deep and structured uh, uh, gene tree, mitochondrial gene tree, as you can see on the right there. Conversely, the green honey creeper looks about the same wherever you go across the Amazon and has a <coughs> relatively shallow mitochondrial gene tree, as you can see on the right there. So Darwin believed that divergent populations represent potential incipient species, that the divergent populations we saw in that, that ant wren, for example, might someday become full species. Um, and this figure from The Origin of Species, you can see along the bottom that these capital letters represent extant species present today. Uh, moving up the figure, we're moving forward in time, and here Darwin de depicts population divergences happening sort of finger-like population divergences happening all the time in some species, such as A and I. Um, but, but few population or no population divergences in some other species. Um, then Darwin projects even further into the future at the top here, um, where he's projecting that, that some of these population divergence events will result in, in new species. And he seems to be suggesting that we get more new species in lineages that have faster rates of population divergence. But is this actually true? Do we actually see that species with, with higher rates of population divergence produce more new species over time um, when we're looking across clades and across deeper evolutionary timescales? So this is significant because it, it means if there is a deterministic effect of rate of population divergence on diversification over longer timescales, then factors promoting population divergence that a lot of us study might be important on very long evolutionary time scales. So previous studies examining this relationship have relied mostly for their uh, estimates of population divergence on taxonomic indices, uh, such as subspecific taxa. Um, Albert Fillmore looked at the number of subspecies in different bird species and also looked at the, the diversification rate uh, along those lineages deeper into time and found that the, the rate of formation of taxonomic subspecies was correlated with uh, diversification rate. Um, some other studies have looked at indirect measures of population divergence. They've looked at variation in traits thought to promote divergence. For example, David Jablonski looked at uh, larval dispersal mode in marine invertebrates and found that dispersal mode had a deterministic effect on macroevolution <coughs> over long time periods. So based on this, this limited empirical data and also theory, we might predict that the rate at which population divergence occurs within a species will be correlated with speciation rate over a long time scale. Now, with the proliferation of genetic data, um, we can come up with quantitative estimates of within species population divergence using, for example, phylogeographic data sets. And we also have a lot of data to estimate speciation rates in the form of phylogenies. So, if we want to do a study on this, uh, we need for each study species the rate of population divergence. So, we need a phylogeographic data set as well as a speciation rate estimate from a phylogeny. So for our project, we focused on 177 bird species. Um, all of these have mitochondrial sequence data from either prior or ongoing studies. Uh, birds are nice, especially new world birds, for the number of phylogeographic data sets that are available. Um, this resulted in a total of over 17,000 uh, individuals across data sets, so over 100 samples per species. Our study species are widely distributed geographically within the mainland New World, and also widely distributed phylogenetically across the, the Aven Tree of Life. So to estimate population divergence from these phylogeographic data sets, we first 
estimated a, a mitochondrial gene tree using BEAST, time calibrated gene tree. And then we use a method called BGMYC. Uh, it's a Bayesian implementation of the GMYC model to estimate the number of, of population clusters in our data set or genetic species. And what GMYC does is it finds, it demarcates um, coalescent processes within species which are happening near the tips from um, a Yule process, um, it's a, a process happening between lineages representing uh, genetic species or, or clusters that's closer to the base of the tree. And it uses that demarcation to delimit groups. In this case, for this mass to tire, we have four groups based on BGMYC analysis. Um, but we're interested in the rate of population divergence. So we took the crown age of all the lineages within our in-group, uh, within our study species, and used that to estimate a pure birth rate of population formation or genetic species formation within our study species. So for each species, each of our 177 studies, study species, we now have a, a rate of population divergence, and we still need speciation rate. So for our phylogenetic data for estimating speciation rate, we use this phylogeny of all birds from Yetz and colleagues. It's the only available time-calibrated ultrametric tree of all birds. Um, and we analyzed this phylogenetic data and estimated speciation rates using a program called BAM, which you might have heard about in previous talks. Um, BAM is a reversible jump Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo method for estimating the number of rate shifts in a phylogeny and a Bayesian framework. And you can use the posterior distribution of speciation rates from BAM to estimate the mean rate of speciation along any point on any branch in the tree, including the, the, the tips which are represent our study species. So this is a plot of the BAM results um, where I've pruned the tree down just to our 177 study species for which we have phyl phylogeographic data. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation with red colors indicating high rates of speciation, blue colors indicating low rates. So now for our 177 species we have a rate of population divergence over a short time scale, as well as an independent speciation rate over a deeper evolutionary time scale. When we plot our population divergence rates around that, that figure of speciation rates I just showed, um, the, the size of these circles represents the population divergence rate, with bigger circles being faster rates. Um, you don't see much of a pattern here, so the clays with high speciation rates don't necessarily have uh, population divert, high population divergence rates just eyeballing it. But we have to do a statistical test. So to test for an association, we use the semi-parametric trait-dependent diversification test <coughs> developed by Dan Rabowski and currently in press. And it requires replicated associations between character states and diversification rates. <coughs> um, so you have to see a relationship appearing multiple times across your tree in order to recover a significant result. And it controls for covariance among related lineages that have sort of the same evolutionary history. So this is our original research question. Does variation across species and population divergence predict variation in patterns and rates of diversification over deeper time and across clades? What's the answer? The answer is yes, based on this test. It's significant, but it's a, you can see it's a pretty weak relationship, uh, pretty low R-squared value there. But we did recover a significant relationship, and there are a diversity of other factors potentially impacting speciation rates that might result in this relatively weak relationship between population divergence and speciation rate. I don't have time to go into all those, those factors right now, but one that's Pretty interesting is ecological limits to diversity or diversity dependence. So we might see an effect of diversity dependence on speciation rate in some clades. For example, clades, these are our lineage through time plots. Um, lineage accumulate, lineages in some clades accumulate quickly and then slow down, potentially as ecological opportunities disappear 
for new species to evolve in that clade. Um, and this might dampen the effect of the impact of population divergence on speciation rates if ecological limits are the major deciding factor on, on what becomes a species. In other cases where clade diversity is still increasing, we might see that population divergence um, is still the major control on speciation rates. And looking, at, we, we partitioned our data set into clades exhibiting diversity dependence and not. And when we do that, we do see an effect on, on our relationships. So there's a much stronger correlation between population divergence rate and speciation rates in clades not exhibiting diversity dependence, um, consistent with what I was saying on the previous slide. It's a higher R squared value. Um, and there's no significant relationship between divergence and speciation rate in clays that have diversity dependent uh, signatures or that seem to have reached ecological limits. Uh, one last result that's kind of interesting when you just compare our raw, bird, our raw uh, population divergence rates from the phylogeographic data sets to the speciation rates from the phylogenetic data set um, using a pure birth model for the population divergence, we, it's six times fat, the population divergence rate is six times faster than the speciation rate over a longer time scale, which means that out of every, six out of every seven phylogeographic clusters that we see in our phylogeographic data sets are not gonna persist over longer time scales, which is pretty cool. It depends on how you delimit your clusters, of course, but it's a cool result. Um, so in conclusion, there is a relationship between population divergence and speciation rate over deeper evolutionary time. Uh, the relationship is stronger in clades that do not exhibit diversity dependence or do not have, appear to have reached ecological limits. Uh, most of divergent populations appear to fail to persist over deeper evolutionary time. They appear to be ephemeral. And I have a lot of people to thank. I think I have a good amount of time for questions. No, so it, it so across all groups within a given tree, yes, um, I believe that's how it works. But um, I believe uh, I, I thought I saw Brian Carson's in here, so you could you could ask him um, how it actually works. Is he developed? Is that clustering Sorry, what was that? Uh huh. It appears to be in some lineages and not in others. Um, a lot of these are tropical species, and a lot of that genetic diversity appears to be cryptic diversity that we don't really see in, phen in the phenotypes of those organisms. Um, but some of it, yeah, definitely does correspond to subspecies level taxa or seraphenotypic variation. Right here. How did you distinguish between the diversity dependent clades and the non dependent clades? So we used the BAM results and we looked, so BAM actually estimates um, um, time variable speciation rates along branches. So we actually looked from the beginning of a clade to the end of the clade if there was a significant slowdown or not in that speciation rate. And we used that to categorize our, our lineages. Yep, in the back. Okay, last question. Okay. How much do you think your mismatch is identifying a place in which there's a lot of cryptic species where it appears slow at the speciation level, but actually there are a lot more species out there? Um, sorry, can you explain that again? That's, so when you see blue and bam, where there's not much of a speciation rate, but a really high within population divergence, how much do you think that's revealing clades in which cryptic speciation is a big issue? In which cryptic? I think. Speciation is a big issue. So there are a lot more species out there in that clade, but we just haven't identified them. They're maybe more biologically or similar. Sure. So this, this has to do with, with how we, we delimited the species we used for analysis. And yeah, so that's obviously a big issue, especially in the tropical taxa where a lot of these, the taxonomies haven't been revised. And to try to look at that, we actually used two different taxonomies to delimit our species. 
um, a more split taxonomy in which we have more species overall and a more lumped one, and they give us very similar results. So hopefully that's not a, a huge issue biasing our, our results. Okay, one last round of applause for Michael.